Addiction is a big problem. It's hurt many people, including people in my family, and I'm deeply committed to trying to do something to fix it. And that's what we're doing here at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. But before I get into that, let me tell you how to think about addiction, because you need to understand what it is so that you can figure out how to treat it. I think about addiction as being hungry. Hungry like you've never been before. Hungry so desperately hungry that it invades every single thought and you think about it all the time and if you see a picture of food or you see someone with food, you just want to rip it and grab it. Well, I think that's what we've come to understand about addiction is that it's just like that. In fact, we've come to understand that the addiction hijacks as brain processes that uh, are tied up with food, the act getting of food and water. Those are old brain processes that have been around for a long time and are necessary for successful sur uh, survival. I call those the impulsive brain parts, impulsive decision systems. And we've known that for a long time, but we haven't known that there's something else that's also going on in addiction, something that we don't and haven't been attending to because it's quiet. For example, if you run into a room and you see two people, one who's screaming and yelling and carrying on, the other one who's sitting quietly, of course you'll attend to the one that is screaming and yelling. And that's what we've been attending to, the person who's really so hungry for their drugs that they're willing to do anything. But there's another part going on here. It's a quiet part that's too quiet. We call that part the executive system, and it's not operative or not operative enough in the addictive. Uh, it's usually associated with more recent parts of the brain, and those parts of the brain more susceptible to insult and all kinds of things that could make them less uh, functional. Here you see the executive system indicated by the, the cool blue, and it's the seat of consideration of the future, reflecting on the past so that you can make changes for the future. And we also have the impulsive systems that are hot and very emotional and very reactive. The implications of having a less than active executive system and a hyperactive impulsive system is reflected by this data that we obtained where we looked at how much um, opioid dependent individuals, that is heroin addicts, uh, considered the future. We asked uh, heroin addicts and match controls to fill in the back end of the story and the story was simply you think about your future and you think. And we're not concerned with the content, what we're concerned with is what's the time frame. And here you see uh, the match controls. They thought of a future of 4.7 years, while the heroin addicts thought of a future of nine days. Or said another way, the uh, controls referred, referred to a future of 1,715 days, and the, con the heroin addicts referred to a future of nine days. That provides an important context for understanding the behavior of addicts. If you only consider the next nine days, you can do a lot of stupid things because the consequences of them will only arrive after the nine days have come and gone. So recognizing now that we have two systems, we can think about that we have two targets for treatment. We have an impulsive system that we need to dampen down, and we have an executive system that we need to push up. Since we've, we've known for a long period of time that the impulsive system has been around, there are existing treatments for that that seem to operate on, that, on that, um, those systems. Uh, one of them is satiation. So if you've got somebody who's very hungry, you give them food so they're satiated. Well, for people who are heroin addicts, there are long-acting forms of uh, opioid medications that essentially takes away their craving and allows them to operate on a regular basis. If you're a heroin addict, you need to get an injection of heroin every four to six hours on average. If you receive methadone, you just have to take it once a day orally. Uh, and so is, that's also true for Suboxone, which is a newer uh, medication that's used for that uh, indication. Also, for smokers, we have the nicotine patch, which is a long-acting form of, of the, exactly the same thing people are smoking for, nicotine. But by allowing them to have that sort of constant supply, they're not constantly looking for the next dose of nicotine. Also, there's constraint. We can constrain that by giving incentive systems that reward individuals for remaining absence. And what's very interesting about that is that individuals who want to quit and say they want to quit and are serious about it but aren't able to quit, if you give them this incentives, you can produce the change. So if you have someone come in two or three times a week, 
measure whether they've used drugs by, by the urinalysis results, you can, um, and reward them for like two or three bucks, you can produce dramatic change in somewhere between 30 and 60% of the population that shows up. So those systems, uh, treatment systems are operative, they work very well uh, in the addicted individual. Particularly with the uh, contingency management, it's meeting the addict where they are, they're thinking about short terms, so you're rewarding them for short term um, activity. Instead of asking to do things that might be hard, which is think about the future. We've also been uh, very interested, now that we know about this executive system, in trying to develop our understanding of it so that it can impact treatment. And if you can't remember the past, you can't think about the future. And there's a lot of data that suggests that. Well, uh, although there are many forms of working uh, of executive function, we were interested in taking that memory portion initially and seeing whether it's able to influence how addicts think about the future. So we took stimulant addicts and we trained them in working memory. We had a control group that received the same exact um, training, except we told them in advance and actually showed them what the correct answers were so they didn't have to work. And we made sure that uh, both groups were, got the same amount of reward, though one was based on actually doing it correctly and the other one was just getting it to match the other group. And what we found was that we were able to change how much these addicts think about the future. We uh, specifically used a measure of discounting, which is how much they, uh, they discount the future. The more you discount the future, the, the less you consider it. And we took these uh, addicts and we measured them pre and post uh, this intervention on training them in working memory. And we looked at the difference. And here we see the data from them looking at uh, the active group and the control group. Each bar is an individual subject. And we're looking at the difference from pre to post. If they're below zero, they've shown a decrease in discounting or they consider the future more. If they're uh, above the line, they are considering the future less. In the active group, we have approximately uh, eight individuals who show uh, substantive uh, decreases in discounting. They consider the future more. While in the control group, we only see two individuals who change. And this is for a hypothetical monetary outcomes that they're discounting. If we look at real outcomes, we get a similar result. Uh, suggesting that this is producing a consistent change in how they think about the future. We're very interested that this may allow us to have inroads into treatment outcomes. We know that how much individuals consider the future determines how well they do in treatment. Those people that consider the future more do better in treatment, all, things, all other things being equal. Now we know to how to get addicts to think more about the future, and by doing so, we think they'll be able to respond better in treatment. And that's what we hope to examine in future studies. So in the future, we want to find out not only does working memory influence treatment outcomes, but other aspects of executive function. We want to know, um, we want to understand whether medications might be able to treat this executive function, improve it, and allow uh, individuals to do better in treatment. And we're also interested in whether a treatments that combine elements that address the impulsive system, such as the uh, medications or the contingency management, and this ex executive function training collectively produce better outcomes than either one alone.